Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to see you. I'm going to apologize up front for not being able to be here the last couple of days, so I'm really sorry I missed your talks. They sounded great, and also for being a little frazzled. I had family coming in from Iowa, Colorado yesterday in the snowstorm, and we were, it took them till 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning to get there, so everything is a little bit off kilter today, which is why I didn't get here earlier. All right, I'm going to talk to you about one of my favorite animals in the world, sharks and rays. It's not the only thing I work on. Um, but it, they are really quite fascinating animals. And I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society, the organization that's based and has been working out of New York City for over 100 years. Uh, it, uh, we operate the, the four parks in New York City, um, Central Park Zoo, Bronx Zoo, the ship, flagships, Queens and Prospect Park, as well as the New, New York Aquarium. The program that I direct is called the New York Seascape Program, and it is a, um, a joint program of the Global Marine Program and the Aquarium. So I basically represent the conservation side of the New York Aquarium based in Coney Island. All right, so um, quickly, I'm just going to give a, a very rough outline of what I want to cover today. I'm going to give you, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with the ecology and biology of sharks? Okay, so not too many, so I, I won't be wasting my time if I give you a little introduction to shark uh, biology and ecology and conservation, including some of the threats that these animals face. I'll tell you a little bit about what's happening in our waters when it comes to these animals, and then what WCS has started to do in terms of the research. So, we, a lot of people talk about, oh, there are sharks. And really, there's no such thing as a shark. Sharks actually are from a very large group of fishes. Uh, they are the cartilaginous fishes, or the chondrichthians, as opposed to the osteichthyes, or the bony fishes. Uh, and they're uh, made up of about 1,200 uh, species of skates and rays, which collectively, let's see if I can point this to you, collectively are known as batoid. I'm gonna, I'll end up using these words inadvertently throughout the, uh, my talk today, so this is why I want to introduce you to some of the tax, taxonomic language. Um, batoids, um, there are 500, about 500 species of sharks currently in the world. Uh, more shark rays and skates, which together are the batoids. And if you ever hear of the term elasmobranchs, that refers to sharks and, and the batoids together. In addition, there's another group of animals called chimeras or commonly ratfishes. And I'm not going to talk about those at all today. Uh, interestingly, a new shark species or, or ray species is discovered every two weeks, still is. So these animals are found in all places of the world, and uh, it's, it's amazing how much the, uh, the biodiversity and the taxonomy is changing all the time. But the problem with having so many species in a group is it really complicates management of these animals. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So what is a shark? Okay, today when I talk, say sharks, oftentimes it's going, I'm going to be referring to automatically skates and rays as well. I'll just use sharks uh, to keep it more simplistic. And one thing about sharks, skates and rays, they don't have a bone in their body. Their skeletons are made out of cartilage. Um, they're also characterized by having naked gill slits, meaning that they don't have a cover over their gills, and most sharks have five to seven gill slits. And then they uh, all experience internal fertilization. So those are characteristics common to all these animals, all 1,200 species. But then how, how do sharks differ from skates and rays? Well, sharks have, um, their gills are on the side of the body, whereas skates and rays have them on the, on the ventral, on the, on the, the underneath surface of their body. All right, so that's one difference. The, the other difference is that sharks tend to be more torpedo-shaped, torpedo and, and rays tend to be dorsally flattened. Okay. However, there are sharks like this angel shark, which occurs in our waters, that is totally flattened. All right, and then there are rays that tend to be more shark-shaped. So you can't always go by the shape, all right, of these animals. It's best, we are beginning to call skates and rays flat sharks, and we're doing it because, and I'll be talking more about this later, we're doing this because we have a lot of concerns about skates not getting the same kind of attention, conservation awareness, fisheries management, that sharks do and, and that they need and, and deserve because there are a lot of, there are a lot of problems uh, in skate management and, and conservation. So I, we, we are, you'll, you're beginning to, you'll begin to hear that more and more in the, shark, in the conservation world. 
Sharks occur in all waters, all oceans of the world, and they're distributed among many different kinds of habitats. Uh, most of the sharks occur in coastal, water, coastal waters and estuaries and near shore, um, but some of them occur in very deep water. Those sh deep water sharks tend to be very slow growing because the productivity in those systems is very low. It can take them many, many years to reach maturity, and, uh, and they live very long lives. All right. When you have species that occur, these animals that occur in so many places, first of all, many of them are highly migratory. And that complicates management also because it means that they're crossing all kinds of jurisdictions. They don't pay attention to boundaries um, and, and, and that we set for them. And so it becomes a real complication uh, in terms of trying to manage their fisheries. So I'm fond of saying that sharks suffer from an identity crisis. And I say that because they, they are among the most fierce animals on the planet and among the most maligned animals. And yet, from a biological perspective, they are also among the most vulnerable. So we all know, uh, every, has everybody, anybody not seen Jaws? OK, I've never seen Jaws. And I am made fun of all the time. I don't, I've never seen Jaws. I have this thing about not, like, not maligning animals in any way. And also, I don't want to be thinking about Jaws when I'm in the water with these sharks. So, um, but, but uh, there is a popular perception that, jo that um, when Jaws came out, people's attitude toward these animals changed. And there became a, a, a frenzy to c control and kill uh, sharks. All right. And so, just to get this out of the way, because we know that, for example, a lot of people's appeal of connection with sharks comes from Discovery's Shark Week that tends to focus on shark attack and, uh, and more of the gore and terror around sharks than I would prefer, the, the conservation stories and management needs. Um, but so I just wanted to make the point that it's very highly, highly unlikely that you would ever encounter a shark or have a, be exposed to a shark attack. You're more likely to be, have, be killed by a vending machine falling over on you. <laughs> All right. And more people in New York City are bitten by other people every year than anywhere near the number of shark attacks. All right. So I'll just try to put that in perspective. Um, and in New York, just in case you were in, you're wondering, uh, shark attack is very rare as well. Unprovoked attacks, only nine in the past 175 years. And there's never been a fatal attack in New York. California, Florida, um, Hawaii, and um, Australia, South Africa tend to have more um, shark attack. All right, so I mentioned before that sharks are, are maligned, but they're also extremely vulnerable, and this is why. They have a life history char characteristics that make them very susceptible to overexploitation. Fishing pressure can quickly knock down populations, and because they are such slow grower or case selected animals, it takes them very, very long to recover. And so, by nature, they have um, slow growth. For example, a dusky shark can take uh, 21 years to reach sexual maturity. Dusky sharks we have in our water, very, very heavily depleted. Um, when they do have young, they can have very few young. So some of these animals only have, for example, sand tigers, which I'll talk about in a little while, only give birth to two pups every two or three years. And they live a long time, so the generation time is very, very slow. It makes them very vulnerable to overexploitation, and once their populations are depleted, they do, it takes them a long time to recover. Um, one, one species that we'll, t we'll mention today, the spiny dogfish, has the longest gestation period of any animal on the planet. It takes, it, it's, it, it's pregnant for over 24 months. So these animals are a lot more like uh, mammals, whales, than they are the bony fishes like tuna or swordfish that, we're thinking, that we think about in terms of fisheries exploitation, food, and management. Threats to sharks are many, everything from pollution to climate change to um, ship strike even. But the number one threat to sharks across the world, the reason why our pop shark populations are so depleted, is because, uh, and again, this refers to sh skates and rays as well, is due to fishing. 
all right? There, we have been commercially fishing for sharks for a long time, and recreational fishing has, is increasingly popular as well. Now, New York is actually known as a mecca, probably one of the few places in the world um, that you can go and actually target the big game sharks, like blue sharks, mako sharks, and thresher sharks. So it, it's very important to our, this is an important recreational fishery, important economically as well. And uh, these are just some images here of, for example, the, one of the problems for sharks is that they are taken incidentally. So this is a blue sh uh, hammerhead shark that is caught in a, in, a, in a rope or a long line, taken incidentally to other fishing. So a lot of sharks on the high seas, like makos and blue sharks, are taken on long lines that are targeting swordfish and tuna. Uh, it's in incidental, and in some cases, the take of blue sharks is higher than the take of the target species, like tuna. Um, and this is, this is bycatch is a really very difficult thing to manage, and from a concept conservation perspective, we're working on that quite a bit. Uh, but as I said before, may, recreational fishing can also have take its toll. In the 1980s, I think, here in the mid-Atlantic, more sharks were killed by recreational fishermen than they were in commercial fisheries, something like over 10,000 sharks a year. So um, we have to manage our, our fish, those fisheries as well. Overall, shark landings, sh the take of sharks have been increasing since this is not data from FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. 143 countries in the world report shark landings every year, um, often not very well and often highly underrepresented. It's, we, it's, this is estimated that the in the peak in 2003 was about 1.3 million tons, and we think that's about half of what's actually being taken. So underreported under and illegal fishing is a real problem as well in shark fishery management. Um, oh, let me go back just a sec. This number down here is the current estimate, the best estimate that I have and use, uh, as to how many sharks are killed every year for their fins. Um, our median is about three, 38 million. So if you think about how the balance of power in the oceans between how many people are take, kill, taken out by sharks and how many sharks we take, it's really not a, not, not a very fair game. The upshot of all this fishing, and the fishing is, by the way, driven by one thing I didn't say and I didn't want to talk too much about. One of the reasons why these numbers went up so much starting in the, in the 1980s here was the demand for shark fins in, in Asian cuisine. There was a huge, um, the Maoist China opened up. There was a market there for luxury goods and shark fin soup is a wedding banquet food. It's used a lot um, at, in all kinds of celebratory um, functions. And so the demand rose and rose and rose. And uh, we are now trying to curb that demand by putting in laws that prevent the practice of finning, which is cutting the fins off of shark and throwing the carcass back in the, in the water. That practice is illegal in many countries around the world, all, all, all in all U.S. waters. Um, it's, it's meant to help reduce mortality, but there is still an unsustainable demand for fins and meat as well going on. And then finally, what is the upshot of this? Of all, all of those, so the IU, everybody knows who the IUCN is? IUCN is, an, is a group that monitors the status of many, many different species groups. It's a, it's a function, it's a um, professional organization that I belong to as part of the shark specialist group. And we, for the last 18 years, have been looking at the status of sharks and rays around the world. And basically we found that a quarter percent of those what did I say, like uh, 1,200 species, a quarter of them are considered to be threatened with extinction. Sharks and rays are among the most threatened group of vertebrates on the planet right now. And among those, the skates and rays are even more threatened than the sharks. So uh, we are redoubling our efforts to try to do something to change that, that wave and uh, rein in fisheries management, rein in demand, stop more, uh, unsustainable mortality before these animals disappear for good. Okay, so that was the global picture. That's sort of the background, the context for why con many conservation organizations are now focusing on sharks. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what's in our waters, because I know you're all here to think, learn about Long Island's amazing biodiversity and, and, and marine fauna. 
So we have in our waters for about 46 species of, of sharks and rays. This comes from the work of John Waldman, who I'm sure many of you have read, Heartbeats in the Muck, and some of his other publications. Uh, we, those 46 species include about two dozen sharks, uh, which you see depicted here, and a number of skates and rays as well. Now, the program that I work for, that I, that I direct, is called the New York Seascape Program. And we consider this to be the purview or the, or the geographic scope of the work that we're doing. So the, some of the, all the work that I'm involved in involves New York State waters, Long Island Sound, what we call here the New York Bite. All right, and all the species that you see here from the sand tiger shark, the really toothy shark that you see in all different kinds of aquarium, to a number of these different skates. Um, this, the basking shark, is the second largest fish in the world. It's common in, this, in, in these waters. And if you think all sharks and rays are, are voracious predators, well, this one just eats plankton. Um, so we do have three species of planktivorous sharks among all those that I told you about. Hammerheads, we have two species of hammerheads, the smooth and scalloped in our water. We have dogfish, and we also have some of the fastest animals. This is a, a mako shark, and this amazing animal, the thresher shark, which is also very much in threatened and endangered. This animal is now protected under CITES. We can no longer trade unsustainably in their fins, so th some of these animals are protected, and other ones, like the stork thorny skate, is going down the tubes with very little protection whatsoever. Um, all right, so most people who are, most New Yorkers have no idea when I talk to them about sharks that we have all these sharks in our waters. And it's really not a new thing. This is not a new phenomenon. We've had sharks here for probably as long as they've been plying in the oceans, which is a couple mil hundred million years. Um, and uh, one of the projects that I'm involved in is called the 400, a 400-year 400 retrospective of fishing and fauna in New York City. And it's actually not it, in and around New York City. It's really all of New York, New York waters. And this project, I'm working with a, uh, um, a historian named Carolyn Hall. E she's an ecological historian, uh, got her master's degree at Stony Brook. She's a phenomenal person. She, she, her work is just great, and it's, this is a really fun project. And I encourage you, if you're interested in historical ecology, go on the New York Seascape website, because we have a preliminary report there that will talk about all 30 different species that we're, we're looking at, landing trends, and anecdotes about their presence in New York all, going all the way back to 1609. Um, so one of the groups of animals we're looking at is the sharks. And these dots here all represent stories or anecdotes in the historical literature from all places that we could, we could dig them up of shark presence in New York, in New York waters, including lots of sightings up into the Hudson River, the East River, along, obviously along the South Shore. And these, this is between uh, 18, these run from 1800 to 2000. One the, this story is particularly a fun, a fun story. Uh, this is one that John Waldman talks about in Heartbeaks in the Muck, about a shark that got lost in 1860 and found itself in the Gowanus Canal in New York City, and then was created quite a furor, and then was promptly shot by the police. So even back then, everybody was afraid of sharks, and uh, again, only shark was a Dead shark, I think that's the shark right there. Um, and this story is a really a, an interesting story for me because this is, I know it's not a very good photograph, but it is a picture, if you can tell, of sharks piled on the dock at the Bayshore Marina on, on the south shore of Long Island. And Bayshore has had a shark fishing, a mako fishing tournament since 1961. It is the longest um, shark tournament, I think, in the United States, continuous tournament, so over 50, I guess it's going on the 54th year now. Um, but this was taken back at the time when, again, the only good shark was a dead shark. And at the end of the tournament, all the animals that were caught were just tossed up on the dock, measured, somebody won, and then got loaded into the back of a dumpster, dump truck, and got taken off to a to a, um, a landfill or someplace. Thankfully, these kinds of scenes don't happen anymore. There is more and more push, even here on Long Island, for um, no-kill tournaments to try to stop the practice of, you know, let's measure them somehow and we don't have to kill them to bring them in and win a prize. So that's a really good sign. But this did take its toll, and Makos now are so compared to what they were a couple centuries, a couple decades ago, are so uncommon that this tournament in the 19, 
90s had to introduce a bluefish category because the probability of catching a mako was so low. And this is kinds of thing is happening up and down the eastern seaboard. Um, so in the, in the conservation community, we also often talk about the beginning of the, con of, the, of the problems for sharks and the fisheries for sharks started in the 1980s when Maoist Ch China opened up to lug itself to luxury goods and there was a huge demand for shark fins. But in actuality, shark fins have been traded for, for millennia. And the United States didn't start tar targeting sharks and promoting shark fisheries just three decades ago. It's been doing it since the early 1980s when the Bureau of Fisheries first came to be. And the Bureau of Fisheries is the grandfather uh, organization, the, the precursor to the National Marine Fisheries Service. And so we, in this project that we're doing, this 400-year retrospective, we're digging into the lit literature to find out what are the drivers? What's causing these declines in animals? How much was fishing a cause? And then how much did choice, consumer choice, what the food that you, you choose to eat and buy, how much was that a driver in pushing these fisheries forward and down? And so we dug up a lot of fun information, including, for example, uh, in, there was a group of very, we very uh, wealthy New Yorkers who jo jo uh, formed a group called the Ichthyophagus Club, meaning Ichthyo Fish Eating Loving Club. And they would try to eat anything that came out of the ocean. And every year they would have an annual meeting and um, they would put something on, you know, put new things on the menu. And the, I don't know if you can read these things, but, you know, bis bisque of starfish, uh, sea spider crab, um, s uh, what else? I mean, salmon, other things that obviously, um, you know, have been on the menu for a long time. But skate is something that appears here. And so there has been promotion of skate going all by the fishery service, exploiting them, um, selling them <laughs> fins to China, going back into the, into the early 1800s. So there's been a lot of pressure on sharks in our waters. And this is all local, happening right here in and around New York. Um, by the way, this this came from, we, part of that uh, 400 year retrospective that I'm talking about, we analyzed 1,500 New York City restaurant menus going back to the late 1700s to see what seafood people were eating and how that has changed over time um, and how that may have affected the fisheries and the, and the health of, fish, of different fish populations in New York. And uh, hopefully, we'll fund, funder, funding willing, we will be able to do some more and get some of that data out because it's really a fascinating story. And I'll give you, I'll give you a little spoiler alert. Basically, we've been eating the same damn thing for the last 150 years. Um, sharks, I'm sorry, uh, shrimp and, and oysters are the things that here in New York tend to top the charts on restaurant menus for decade after decade after decade, all the way going back into the mid-1800s. Um, but it's a really fun, fun story. All right, so what's happening with sharks here in New York in terms of their fisheries? Well, these, this data takes you all the way back to 1880. So this is part of the data that we pulled together for that 400-year retrospective. And if you can see, the blue is, a, is smooth dogfish, um, or skates, I'm sorry. And we have been sort of bumping along the bottom here, relatively small landings, until the mid-1880s when that demand for fins kicked into place. And then we started having huge fisheries, really big fisheries for dogfishes, smooth dogfish and spiny dogfish. These are both two very small sharks with very different life histories. Smooth dogfish is the one I mentioned to you that, la that takes two years to reach, um, to give birth. Um, whereas the sp smooth dogfish can mature in two years and can have lots and lots of young. So very different life histories. They look very similar, have similar names, but um, can support fisheries in a very different way. And if you look here, this is, is what's been happening with the skates and rays that I was just telling you about. So, seven, about in the 19, in 19, mid 1990s, I did a report on New York shark fisheries, and I reported on what was in our what, what's in our what's in our fishery. What how many, how many species have we taken? And at least 13 different species were reported. Today, you look at the literature; only five species occur in the, in, in in there. We'd have really managed to 
clamped down on fisheries, and so we regulated some of them out of the fishery, but other things are so depleted we can no longer sustain a viable fishery for them. The skates that today, the spiny dogfish and the smooth dogfish account for 80% of our, of our shark landings and in New York, and I'm sorry, 97% uh, of our shark landings, and of all the Alaska banks, skates account for 80%. And this is comprised of about two species of skates primarily, the little skate and the winter skate. And the little skate is used mostly for bait in the lobster fishery. The winter skate is the source of you go to a restaurant now, a fancy restaurant, and they're serving skate wing. It's probably coming from winter skates, and winter skates are considered endangered under the IUCN red list. So we're targeting fisheries that are poorly managed for a luxury food that can't sustain it. And so this is some, one of the species, these, are, these animals are some of the things that I, as part of the Wildlife Conservation Society, is working, uh, working to uh, improve the management for them. And this, by the way, is the report I mentioned, the 400 retrospective. All right. So that's kind of the, the fishery side of the story. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the research that we're doing in the ecology side now. And we're going to, moving from offshore all the way inshore as I talk about these different studies. So in 2010, WCS, who has been in, in New York for over a century, finally decided it was time to do marine conservation in its own backyard. And that's when we established the New York Seascape Program. And that program had to pick, you know, what are we going to work on? There's so many marine issues here. And, it, and sharks were, was an obvious um, choice because the New York Aquarium, you know, has sharks in their collection. They also have this scientist, um, Hans Walters, who was the first scientist to put satellite tags in sand tiger sharks. He got his master's degree at Hofstra and was doing that work, not here, but off North Carolina. And my background is, with Audubon for 10 years was doing shark conservation policy. So it made sense that we'd start a project working on sharks. All right, we know, we know there are 30, 26 species of sharks in these waters, but we don't know when they're here, why they're here, when they come and go, how they're using habitat, um, what cues are there, do they come back year after year? And so uh, teasing out the ecology and, 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 and the whys of why these animals are here was as part of our job. Um, we want to do this. First of all, because we want to improve fisheries management. We want to identify critical habitat that might need protection. And also because we want to make sure there's a place for wildlife in these increasingly busy waters of New York. You know, we, we have the biggest harbor in, in, in the country. Um, and there's a lot of interactions with those ships and sand mining and everything else uh, with wildlife. It's our job to make sure there's a place for wildlife amongst all those competing demands uh, on, the, on the marine habitat. So we established the marine cons the, our shark research project. And Hans Walters is my partner in crime, along with Jake LaBelle, um, a graduate student at Stony Brook who joined as an intern and has been working with us ever since. Um, we are working with strictly with volunteer in, uh, anglers and interns. So this, we kind of run this a bit on the shoestring. And I'm going to tell you about a couple of the different projects that we're engaged in. All right, first of all, what are we working on? We're working on four of those uh, 26 species that, uh, of sharks that I mentioned. Our primary targets in the last couple of years, and this work started in 2012, sand tiger sharks and shark fin mako. Very highly prized as a, as a um, um, recreational target. This animal is very heavily depleted. This is the one I told you only gives birth to two young uh, after uh, a two year, after every two or three years because the young inside eat their own, eat each other in the embryo. So they have two, uh, in the uterus. So they have two, uteri two uteri and the biggest and strongest of them basically survives by eating its brothers and sisters until it's ready to be born. And so it has a very low reproductive potential. With smooth dogfish, the one I said it was a, was a, uh, a, a strong fishery, um, a, a potential fishery, we, we're working, we want to start working on those, and blue sharks we're also tagging. And we're doing this work through acoustic and satellite tagging. So that's how we're getting an idea of where these animals are, how they're moving, what they're, when they're here, where, when they're leaving. Skates, I'll talk about later if it's not part of the tagging project as of yet. All right, so starting with the satellite tagging. Um, in 2012, we put our first tag, satellite tag, in a mako shark. And that tag was an archival 
pop-up tag. And what that means is that we have to catch the shark, we embed a, uh, like a, almost, almost like a molly in the back of the shark, um, and then we will dangle, let's see, is this, this working? Uh, from, from this molly in the back, in the dorsal of the shark, uh, it tows this tag. Now this tag is capable of collecting light data and depth data, and with that, through modeling, when you get the data, you can get the position of the, ta of the animal over the course of however long you set the tag. So what's called a pop-up tag, because we would, you'd set how long the, an the tag stays on the animal, when animal, when you, so in this case it was 90 days. At 90 days, the tag releases itself, it goes to the surface, and once it hits the surface, it starts relaying all the data that it's been archiving to orbiting satellites, and then from there down to our computers, our laptops. And with that, you can then figure out what, where the animal has been going, what it's doing. Um, so this, is a, this one is an interesting story, because we tagged this animal off of Montauk, and it was late, it was in October. We set it for 90 days, but a month later, we started getting data from the animal, from the tag, and we couldn't understand why. And then we looked at the data, and we started analyzing the data, and it was quite odd, because the data was coming from land, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And, okay, so it's really hard to use the data and to figure out, a lot of times you get, as, as Hans will say, it's like spitting, you know, spitballs on the wall. You get this sort of array of where these animals are moving and you kind of have to clean the data. So we thought, well, maybe it was a problem. But then we got a call from the National Marine Fishery Service that the tag was actually taken by a long line fisherman who caught this shark and killed it, saved the tag, brought the tag to land, and then was gonna return the tag to us which was great news because usually these tags, which cost about $3,000 a piece, when they release, they go to the surface, you, don't return, you get the data, but you don't get the tag back. In this case, we were able to get both the data and the tag. And while it's very sad for the shark, we did, we did many, of these, many of these Makos are taken in long line fisheries, incidentally, and also targeted um, off our waters. Um, we got the data, and what it did, what we learned from that data is that these animals spend a lot more time near the surface than we ever realized. Most, so most, at, most sharks spend time below the surface. The mako, these makos were coming to the surface, and what that meant was that we could put a different kind of satellite tag on this animal. We could put a tag that actually was what we call a, a near real-time recording tag. So instead of waiting three months and get a, to get a bunch of data, and then you have to, you know, you have to clean it up and figure out what the track is every time the animal comes to the surface and that if the antenna breaks the surface, you get a, you get a position and a much cleaner and much more, a, a much more accurate position so that you can actually follow the shark's movements as long as the tag is, is um, still operational. So that was great data. We decided to switch from archival tags to these near real-time monitoring tags called splash or spot tags. And we started fishing uh, last year off of Montauk, off of Bayshore, off of, uh, you know, wherever we can get a boat and get out on the water, we did it. We were able to catch uh, three makos and, and one blue shark and put these new tags in them. And followed the tags for a number of, you know, for a number of months. We were hoping these, that these will last, they'll stay on the shark, they don't pop off, and they will last as long as the battery lasts. And in some cases, that could be up to a year. So you can really get an idea of an annual uh, migratory pattern um, with them. But unfortunately, three of the tags are no longer reporting to us. We don't know if it's because the shark was killed, if the, if the, uh, the battery f fell off the shark and then went, you know, just dropped to the surface, or whether the battery died. But we do have a story from one of the sharks that I want to share with you, and that is this mako right here, a, a young juvenile make, mako um, that was tagged in July um, right outside of, uh, I think it was about 18 miles off of uh, Fire Island Inlet. And then we go out with, the way we do this is, this, by the way, this is Hans Walters up here holding this new kind of satellite tag, a real, a real time reporting tag. This is us putting a tag, the tag on the shark. We don't bring them on the vessel, we leave them in the water. Uh, we want to do as minimal damage to them as possible, less trauma, and let them go. And then this is that same animal swimming away, carrying a nice little piece of jewelry right here on its back. 
And I want to mention something to you before I forget, that this picture was taken by a photographer named Keith Ellen Bogan. He's a New York, he works at FIT, he's a professor at FIT, he's an underwater photographer, and we're doing a separate project called uh, Underwater New York, where we're trying to get photographs of any animals we can from um, uh, underwater. And so if any of you have good places to go, fun places, anim anything underwater, any wildlife that you would like photographed or think is a great spot, I'm all ears about that because we're, we're looking for a way to capture as much of New York's biodiversity, marine underwater biodiversity as possible in this project. Um, okay, so quickly, because I'm running out of time. Um, so this is the track from that shark, all right? And I don't have to walk you through it because it's a little bit difficult to, to follow. The star is where the animal was tagged in July. It spent July mostly right in these waters. In August, went up the coast to hang out off of uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts, came back, spent a little more time near New York. By early fall, I think August and September, it started heading down, uh, down the coast. In October, it decided to hang out in uh, Oregon and Maryland went further south to spend time in, uh, I guess it was October, November, December, January, off, you know, it's a real snowbird here, uh, off the um, Cape Hatteras, big concentration of, 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 a lot of time spent there, and then got wanderlust in February and decided to make this massive circuit, clockwise circuit, all through February, and now in, in March is right back here in North Carolina. This is, to me, this is so fascinating. It went all the way out into international waters, 200, 300 miles out. Why? We don't know yet. This is only one animal. We need to tag a lot more animals before we'll be able to make sense of this. But th this is really um, useful for us to understand uh, why they're here, what they're doing, maybe discover their mating grounds, because we don't know where these animals may. Acoustic tracking, now we're moving closer in shore. These are coastal waters. Um, with acoustic tagging sand tiger sharks. This is the tag we use. It's about that size. It goes in, uh, gets inserted surgically in the bottom of the shark, just as you see here. Um, we have receivers, acoustic receivers, that are in the buoys in fire. In, this is in Great South Bay. All this work is happening in Great South Bay, right here. We have about 18 of these out this year, these receivers. When the shark swims within 500 yards of the, of the receiver, it gets heard and it, get, uh, and it gets pinged. Um, here's an aerial view of exactly where we are. This is Fire, Fire Island Inlet, and this is our study area. And for years, for a long time, we didn't know where we were going to catch these animals, how we were going to get them, until we heard fishermen anecdotally talking about sharks being in the, caught in the marina. We tag all of our sharks in Atlantic Marina. And I'm not kidding when I say we're, we are sitting on the dock when we're, when we're tagging these animals. And with that, these animals get tagged there, and then we can follow the movements. They ping every time they go by one of those receivers on a Coast Guard buoy, and we're able to develop a track for these animals. The purposes of that are going to help us define what essential fish habitat is for the National Marine Fishery Service for this species and this age class. All these animals, sand tigers, they're all juvenile. And so this is a summary of 2014 data. This is the, this is the animal, the sand tiger shark. You see it in all the aquaria you go to. This was taken by our photographer, Keith Ellenbogen. Jake is my, uh, our assistant. That's us working with volunteer anglers to tag these. We own, don't have a vessel. We depend on volunteers. And these show you this map shows you where we're tagging the animals, and the size of the circles represent how much time this particular animal spent near this particular receiver. And I have a fun story for this animal, but I can't tell you because I'm out of time. Um, and then this is, in addition to what we're doing for, um, uh, in terms of the ecology, we're also, because I work in an aquarium, we have these animals in captivity. No one studied the uh, health um, health parameters of these animals in the wild, so our vets are coming out with us and sampling blood, blood gases, et cetera, for things like toxicology, viruses, um, stress from being captured, et cetera. So that work hopefully is going to expand next year. Um, okay, this is a, not going. Let's see if I can get it to go. This was, oh yeah, there you go. It's a 20 second video of in this case, a blue shark. <laughs> These are all right off, right off our shore. This two sandbar sharks 
Great South Bay used to be an important nursery habitat for sandbar. There's been no record of it recently because sandbars are really depleted. And that's the mako shark that got, a, got the, that towable tag that was eventually killed by the longline fishermen, unfortunately. All right. Um, as I mentioned, we don't we don't do this work alone. This is, takes a lot of help. We depend on volunteer anglers and their boats and their expertise to get us out on the water. If you know of anybody who loves sharks, likes to fish for sharks, has a boat, and is willing to volunteer their time, I'll pay for gas. I'll pay for uh, the bait, and we'd like to have uh, anybody you, you anybody to, to who wants to help us out to this do this conservation work. Um, the final thing I wanted to mention, project I want to do is a citizen science project. Uh, maybe you guys have students, uh, no families, et cetera, that can help. Skates and rays are, under, are underrepresented and underappreciated, as I mentioned. And one of the, this is a new project that we're doing in partnership with the, Sh with the Shark Trust in the UK. Um, the purpose is to get families and kids out on the beaches, but to, to do a little bit of data collection and uh, analysis learn about the ecology and, and biology of these animals, but mostly giving us an opportunity to talk about their conservation needs. And so we are just launching this project now. I'm hoping to hire an outreach coordinator in the next couple weeks to help us out uh, with getting this off the ground. But I would love to hear anybody who's interested in adopting a beach to help collect data uh, and add to our database so we understand about the distribution of these animals on our, in our beaches. And what you're collecting, of course, as you guys all know, these mermaid cases. Skates lay eggs, they lay these egg cases. It usually has one embryo. The animal, it's attached to the bottom or on some structure in the ocean. The embryo hatches out, swims away, and these empty cases wash up onto the beaches. Um, okay, well, I'm not gonna talk about this, only to say skates, skates, skates. It's time that they get the love that sharks have had. They are just as vulnerable. They need attention. They are not well managed. We don't have good data on them. So well, I'll be talking about skates a lot in the coming, in the coming years. Um, and then finally, take home messages. There are so many different sharks and skates and rays out there. It's complicated, but we have a, quite a nice crew of them here in New York. Um, all these animals, pretty much all of them, are, are uh, vulnerable because of their slow life histories. A quarter of the world, sharks, skates, and rays are endangered. And uh, they're more threatened, uh, skates are even more threatened than the sharks, but they're more neglected. Um, we, the, what we have discovered in the sand tiger work is that we think Great South Bay is an important nursery ground for, for the sand tiger sharks. We have data that shows now return of animals three years in a row. So there's site fidelity going on. We're really hoping that the 13 sharks that we tagged last year will come back this year because that will be really strong evidence and I think new evidence of how important this habitat is um, for, the, for this beleaguered uh, shark population. Um, and again, we are in need of help for both the great egg case hunt and for shark tagging. And finally, in 2017, the New York Aquarium is reopening with a brand new huge shark exhibit, 50,000 square, 53,000 square feet, lots of different species. Um, so please come and enjoy us after we recover from Sandy. And all my partners in crime. Thank you.